Hello, welcome to another wonderful week of NMR. We have a lot more amazing stuff to talk about. The NMR um, lesson spans these two weeks. And so last week we sort of talked about the theory of NMR and we kind of went over what an NMR kind of looks like. Uh, let me show you that slide. This was kind of the most important slide last week because we actually saw what a spectrum might look like. I drew it by hand. But really last week all we talked about was chemical shift, how to determine how many signals a compound would give and also how to predict the chemical shift value, the PPM value, along the x-axis for a given signal. And we did that looking at some base values, we had some modifiers, it was pretty cool, it's kind of like a puzzle. And this week we are going to talk about uh, two more things. We're going to talk about uh, something that's pretty easy, which is the integration value, this is the area under the curve, and the shape of the signal, which is going to tell you something about the number of neighboring protons. So let's go ahead and get started with that conversation, and we'll start by talking about the integration. So integration, and I'm going to make my pen a little fatter. Okay, integration. And if you've taken a calculus class or a pre-calculus class, you know what integrations are. Integration is if you have a curve, it can find the area underneath the curve. And don't worry, we're not going to have to do any uh, math because the computer programs do the math for us. So if you have an NMR signal, uh, the computer program will be able to calculate the integration. It does that using an approximation. So it kind of, um, it doesn't actually solve the equations, but rather it kind of does a little funky approximation that gives us the approximate area under the curve. Don't worry about how the computer does it. Back in the old days, you know what they used to do? They used to actually cut out with a pair of scissors the peaks in the NMR and they would weigh the paper on the scale as a crude way of determining the integration before computers. Could you imagine that, cutting out a spectrum and weighing it to figure out how big each peak is? So this, this is the key here. The size of the peaks vertically in an NMR don't really matter and the width doesn't matter either. It's really the area under the curve that matters. And what does it tell us? The area under the curve tells us how many protons are giving rise to a certain signal. So tells how many protons give rise to a signal. So what we saw in the previous lesson is that we can have a chemically equivalent protons, meaning that uh, like two protons, for example, could be in the same chemical environment. They could be homotopic or enantiotopic, and so they would only give one signal. But because there's actually two protons contributing to that signal, the signal is going to have a doubly big area under the curve. The area under the curve is going to increase because there's two protons giving that signal versus another peak, which may only have one proton giving that uh, signal. is going to be a much smaller integration. Keep in mind that this provides a ratio only. In other words, we don't know if it's one to two or two to four or four to six. You know, it's just it, it's only a ratio, a relative amount. So um, it may not be the exact answer. OK, let's take a look at an example because that's going to be the easiest way to, to see it. OK, so let's draw an example compound and how about we draw pentanone, which looks like this. Okay, now let's draw in all the hydrogens that pentanone has. Okay, so there's two methyl groups on the left and right. And because of symmetry, the methyl groups on the left and right are equivalent to each other, right? These, all six of these protons are the same chemical environment. They're both equidistant from that ketone in the middle. They are identical, meaning that all six of these protons are only going to give rise to one signal. So I'm going to go ahead and label these all HA, 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 HA. Of course, within a methyl group, we know that they're always equivalent within a methyl group. But this is taking it one step further. The two methyl groups on the ends of this molecule are symmetric. So they're not just the same within the methyl groups, but also on the ends of the molecule, they're the same with each other as well. And then we've got some CH2 groups uh, next to the ketone. And those are also equivalent due to symmetry. So not only are they equivalent within themselves, but they're equivalent with each other due to symmetry. So this will be HB, 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 HB. So this compound, which I'll, I'll draw it again without the protons, 
just because it gets a little crowded, would give two signals. So first question, how many signals? Two signals. And you should also be able to um, predict the PPM values of these signals. Let's go ahead, let's just do that for practice. So let's predict the PPM values. So for HA, we know that's a methyl base. And the methyl base is 0 0.9 PPM. And these methyl groups are beta to the CO double bond. That's one of our modifiers. And so that's gonna be plus 0 0.2 PPM. And so that's gonna be 1.1 PPM. And now let's do the same thing for HB. For HB, we have a methylene base, which is 1.2 ppm. And then this one is alpha to C double bond O, which has a value of 1.0 ppm. Add those up and we get 2.2 ppm. Okay, so that could be the second question I ask you is how many signals? That could be question one. Question two could be, uh, how, what is the approximate chemical shift of those two signals? And you would say 1.1 and 2.2 respectively. The third question that I could ask, which could be, what is the integration of these protons? And so for HA, the integration would be six because there are six protons, six HA protons. And HB would be four. Now keep in mind that it's only a ratio for integration. So uh, you may get six to four or another acceptable answer would be three to two. So either way, it's totally acceptable. Remember, integration is only a ratio. It may not be the exact number. And okay, we'll see more examples of that. Okay, so that's what you need to know about integration. It just tells you how many protons are giving rise to a certain signal. And I could ask you, what would be the integration of all the protons in this compound? You just add up how many protons there are of that type and that's the integration value. All right, number two is done. Now we're on to number three. The third thing you can tell from the NMR spectrum, and this to me is the most interesting, it's something called multiplicity. It has to do with the shape of the peak. This is the third thing we can tell from NMR. It turns out that signals in NMR sometimes have different shapes. And this gives information, as I said before, about the number of neighboring protons. Okay, here are the shapes that you can have. You can have a singlet, which just looks like a tall line. It's called a singlet. And this is oftentimes abbreviated with just an S in parentheses. You could have a beautiful doublet. A doublet looks like a double fang kind of thing, upside down double fang, doublet. And this is called D for short sometimes. We could have a triplet, which looks like this. It's a triple peak, and this is often abbreviated, yep, you guessed it, P. What do you think this guy is called? With four peaks, it's a beautiful quartet. Oftentimes has the abbreviation Q. Uh, we could have a quintet like this with five peaks. Don't worry about the abbreviation. There's no abbreviation I've seen too common for quintet. They're rare. Uh, how about a sextet? With six peaks. And finally, we'll look at a septet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That would be a septet. Okay, we won't go any further than that. Okay, now these signals you should be able to recognize pretty easily. You just have to count the little lines. Okay, and what this tells you is the number of hydrogens next door. The number of hydrogens on the carbon next door. It tells you about the next door neighbor. 
So if you have a singlet, that means that this signal, the protons that are producing this signal, have no neighbors, no hydrogens next door. If you have a doublet, that means that those protons that are giving rise to the doublet, it could be one proton, it could be 10 protons giving rise to that doublet, if there's equivalency, are going to be next to one neighbor. Triplet, two neighbor. Quartet, three neighbor. Quintet, four neighbor. Sextet, five neighbors. And septet, six neighbors. Hydrogen neighbors. So it's always the number of neighbors plus one gives you the signal pattern. So zero plus one equals a singlet, for example. And one plus one is a doublet. And we'll see why that is. So let's answer the question why. Because nearby protons act like little magnets. Okay, let's take a look at a simple example, okay? I'm going to have two carbons that are connected to each other. They're neighbors. How cute. Maybe they hate each other. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it's cute. And we'll say on one carbon, we have HA, and on the other carbon, we have HB. So these hydrogens are neighbors because their carbons that they're attached to are neighbors. Now let's take a look at HA only, okay? Just considering HA. HA is gonna give some signal in the NMR spectrum. Now there's two possibilities. HA could either be aligned with HB or the spin could be not aligned. Remember that the spins of these protons can either be aligned with the magnetic field or opposing the magnetic field. And depending on the alignment of the neighbor, it can have a slight influence on the local environment. So let's say that HB is aligned with the magnetic field. Then that's gonna have a certain effect on HA. And then there's the other possibility, which is 50% likely, I guess, that HB is not aligned. Okay. What this does is it creates two possibilities. Either HA is aligned or H, or, sorry, either HB is aligned or HA, or Sorry, either HA, HB is aligned or HB is not aligned. That's why we get a doublet. One of the peaks is if the neighbor is aligned and the other peak is if it's not aligned. Don't worry about which one is which. And the distance between these peaks is called J, the coupling constant. J, and J is measured in Hertz. And generally, it's on the order of 1 to 20 hertz. Okay. So what this means is that HA appears as a doublet. Depending on whether HB is aligned or not aligned. So that's exactly the idea here. HA has one neighbor, so it appears as a doublet. Let's take a look at a slightly more difficult example to understand a triplet. Okay, so we're gonna have carbon attached to carbon. We've got some neighbors again. And we'll have HA. And then now let's say on the neighboring carbon there's two HBs. They're chemically equivalent. They give rise to a single signal, so they're both HBs. So there's two HBs on the neighboring carbon. And let me just put in some dummy connectors just so each carbon has four bonds. And now let's again look at the situation with HA. Well, HA could see both HBs aligned with it. So both HB aligned. Okay. Or there's two possible ways for HB to be half aligned. Either the first HB is up and the second HB is down, or the first HB is down and the second HB is up. So one and one, we'll call this where one of the HBs is aligned and the other is not. And then there's, of course, the option where neither is aligned, both HB not aligned. And so now this is gonna result in a triplet. 
looks like this. Okay, and again, each peak is due to each of these possibilities. The first peak is if both are aligned. The taller middle peak is because there's two ways for it to be one and one. And then a shorter peak for when they're both not aligned. So it's based on the probability of all of these options. Obviously, it's there's two ways for it to be one and one, and only one way to be both aligned and, and one way to be both not aligned. And again, we can measure the J value as just the diff, diff, distance between these peaks. Okay, so what that means is that HA appears as a triplet. And that makes sense, right? Because how many neighbors does HA have? HA has two neighbors, so it appears as a triplet. Splitting follows the n plus one rule. So let's say an H had three protons. So if an H had three neighboring protons, it will be a three plus one equals four quartet. Okay, because the n is the number of neighbors plus one, that tells you the splitting pattern. Now, there's a few other rules that we should keep in mind about splitting. Number one is equivalent protons never split each other. Okay, what that means is like, let's say we had a molecule like this. And we can draw in all the protons. Two protons on this carbon, two protons on this carbon. And because of symmetry, all four of these protons are the same. So this is HA, 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 HA. All four of these protons are the same. So they're all equivalent. And so they're just going to appear as a singlet. So all HA are the same. They don't split each other. So that means they don't count as neighbors. We only count different neighbors. We don't count members of our own family in terms of the n plus one rule. So H A equals singlet, as if it had no neighbors at all, because it's neighbor only to itself. Okay. Second thing to keep in mind is that splitting has a limited range. Because these little protons are acting as super tiny magnets, they have a very short range for this effect to occur. Splitting has a range of three, two to three sigma bonds. So let's take a look at the two possibilities. Um, let's say you had a carbon with two different protons on it. That's pretty rare. Usually the protons on a given carbon are equivalent to each other, but let's say we had an HB, HA and an HB. Uh, the way that that could happen is if they were diastereotopic protons. That can sometimes happen. If there's a chiral center somewhere else in the molecule, HA may be slightly closer to, say, a wedge group than HB would be, and that could cause them to be different. Uh, they are two sigma bonds away, one, two, so they can split each other. So that means HA would be split into a doublet by HB because it has one neighbor. Uh, we could also have splitting a, a, along three sigma bonds. This is the more common scenario. So this is what we've kind of seen already. If we have HA and HB... They are now three sigma bonds away, one, two, three. They can split each other. And again, HA is going to be split into a doublet by HB because he has one neighbor. And HB, by the way, will also be split into a doublet by HA. They split each other. Okay. And keep in mind, uh, the J value increases with distance. So for HA and HB, because they're close to each other, the J value is quite large. So the doublet is 
has a, quite a bit of distance between the two peaks versus this doublet is a bit narrower because they're further away. So these are two acceptable scenarios. Uh, let me show you an example of an unacceptable scenario. So this would be an example of long range splitting, which is not possible in this class. It is possible, but not in this class. So if you have HA and HB, these are now too many bonds away to split each other. So one, two, three, four bonds is too many. So they're both just going to appear as um, they're both going to appear as singlets. So no splitting. Too far. Four sigma bonds. Okay. And then back to these two examples. This would be two sigma, and this would be three sigma bonds away. By the way, the first example is called geminal. When you have two protons on the same carbon, we call that geminal, like the Gemini twins. They're like twins. I'm a Gemini, so you can remember that. This first option's like me, the Gemini. And the second option, where they're like on separate carbons next to each other, that's called vicinal. Like they're in the vicinity of each other. So if you ever hear those terms geminal and vicinal, geminal refers to two groups, it doesn't have to be protons, two of anything on the same carbon is geminal, and two of the same thing on neighboring carbons is vicinal. All right, let's do a practice problem. This is pretty cool. Okay, let's do a practice problem, let's do a hard one, okay? Okay, so here's a molecule. What I'd like to do is have you just predict the integrations and multiplicities. We're gonna predict the integrations and the multiplicities, okay? So let me just redraw the molecule just so that we can keep an eye on what this molecule originally looked like. And I'm not going to make you actually predict the chemical shifts here also. I could do that as well. I could actually have you predict all the chemical shifts, but that would take too long, so let's not bother with that. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in really close on it, okay? And in little itty-bitty thin pen, I'm going to draw in all the hydrogens on this molecule. And let's try and draw in hydrogens that are equivalent to each other. Okay, I'm going to start on the left side. And on these methyl groups... We have three hydrogens each, and they're all equivalent to each other by symmetry. So we'll call these all HA. And by symmetry, they're all the same family, right? Even though there's two different methyl groups, they're symmetric with each other. It could freely rotate, and you could interchange these two methyl groups, and they're all homotopic within each other. So all six of those protons are the same thing. Now we've got a little... Uh, hydrogen all on its own on this carbon here. We'll call that HB. That's clearly unique. There's no hydrogen quite like HB. It's kind of an odd man out there. Okay, moving over, we've got HC. Let's do that in orange. And HCs are these two hydrogens here. They're enantiotopic, uh, but they're going to give rise to a single signal. They're not diastereotopic. Usually hydrogens on the same carbon are going to give rise to a single signal. The only op only time that that's not true is when they're diastereotopic, and the only time that's true is when there's a stereocenter somewhere else in the molecule, generally speaking. Okay, then we have HDs right here. Those two are equivalent to each other, but different than HCs because they're further away from that double CO double bond. And then finally we have HEs, and there's a lot of those. HE, 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 obviously all three methyl groups on the terp-butyl group over here are equivalent to each other. Okay. All right, so now let's predict. Okay, let's start off with HA, our good friend HA. The integration for HA is going to be 6 because there are 6 HAs, so I'll just write 6H. And what is the splitting pattern? Well, how many neighbors does HA have? just one hb so ha appears as a doublet okay now let's take a look at hb how many hbs are there just the one so the integration is 1h 
how many neighbors does HB have? Well, there's no hydrogens on this carbon up here, but there are one, two, three, four, five, six carbons on neighboring, six hydrogens on neighboring carbons. So that is gonna be six plus one is seven. That is our septet. Remember, N plus one rule. So if we have six protons, the peak is gonna become a septet for seven protons, seven little mini peaks. All right, next up we have HC. Integration is 2H, there's two HCs, and it's got two neighbors, HD, so it's gonna be a triplet. Two neighbors, it's a triplet. HD is next. There's two H's, the integration is two, and there's two neighbors, HC. Keep in mind there's no neighbors to the right. There's no hydrogens on this carbon, so it's not being split to the right. It's only being split from the left carbon, which has two hydrogens on it. And so that's gonna also be a triplet. Okay, and then finally HE, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them. And how many neighbors do they have? Look at the carbon they're attached to and look one over. No hydrogens attached, so they have zero hydrogen neighbors. And so this is gonna be a singlet. And we could also draw the shapes of these peaks if we wanted to. The doublet would look like this, just look like a double peak. You can either draw it like my cursive way of drawing it, or you can just draw like two lines like this. That could be a doublet. A septet would be seven lines. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Look kind of like that. A triplet would look like this. A triplet would look like this. And a singlet would just look like that, just a line. Sweet. Okay, now let me tell you something that's kind of confusing and kind of fun at the same time, and it has to do with complex splitting patterns. Complex splitting patterns. That is not the complex splitting patterns, that's the PK table. I wanna tell you about complex splitting, although we don't really have time to get into it, so you won't I don't think you'll see any problems with these, but I just want to show you so you're aware. Let's take a look at this interesting situation here where we have, let's draw in the protons to the right of the CO double bond. We would have two protons here, HA, HA, they're equivalent. We'd have two protons here, HB, HB, and we'd have three protons on the methyl group, HC, HC, HC. Okay, obviously we'd also have protons on the on the left side here, but we're not going to worry about that for now. Okay, so now let's take a look at HA. Integration is two. And what would the multiplicity be? The splitting would be a triplet because it has two neighbors, HB. There's two of them, so it'll be triplet. Okay. And what about HC? Well, HC. Oops. HC has an integration of three, because there's three of them, and it's gonna be a triplet also, since it also has two neighbors in HB. But what about HB? What's going on with HB? Well, we know that the integration of HB is 2H, but what about the multiplicity? Well, let's see what happens here. First, it's gonna be split to the left and then it'll be split to the right or vice versa. We don't know the order. But first it'll be split by HA into a triplet. So it's gonna appear like this. Because it's split into a triplet by the two hydrogens to its left. But then each triplet is gonna be split into quartets by the three hydrogens to the right. because right, the three hydrogens to the right would normally split a peak into four in plus one rule. So it's going to turn all of those triplets into little mini quartets. So it's going to look like that at the end. See that each triplet peak, each peak gets turned into its own quartet. 
So that's what would actually happen because it's got two different neighbors, a neighbor to the left and a neighbor to the right that are different. We don't just add up all the neighbors and say, okay, there's one, two, three, four, five neighbors, so it'll be a sextet. No, instead you have to treat each neighbor separately and say, okay, first it's gonna be split into a triplet and then it's gonna be split into a quartet. Or you could say first it'll be split into a quartet and then a triplet. Either way, it's okay. Uh, now, this is confusing, right? This is tricky. This would be called a triplet of quartets. Okay, we don't really have time to talk about this, sometimes it's abbreviated TQ, so I wanna save you the time. If you have complex splitting, just call it a multiplet, so shortcut. This is kind of a lazy shortcut, but it's acceptable in this class. Multiplet. for complex splitting. So we can just say that HB is a multiplet. And that'll always be the case when you have like different neighbors. Okay. Uh, now, one last thing I want to say about splitting, and then that'll be the end of this lesson, and there'll be one more short lesson about carbon in MR. But one thing I want to say about splitting is that some protons do not couple. Those are A. Protons on oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. So, for example, this hydrogen on an alcohol, the hydrogen on a thiol, or the hydrogens on a nitrogen, they don't couple. They don't split through the heteroatom. You don't consider it like, for example, a triplet because of the two hydrogens on the carbon next door. So all of these protons appear as a broad singlet. Okay, so you should never see a doublet or a triplet or anything like that for those protons. Look for a broad peak. It kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. Kind of think of it like the tongue on a um, IR spectrum. Remember how the alcohol looked like a smooth tongue? It ends up looking kind of similar on the NMR as well. You don't see any splitting patterns or multiplicity with those protons. And then finally, aldehyde protons. They don't split either. They always look like a singlet. So if you have a hydrogen on an aldehyde, even though you have three hydrogens on the neighboring carbon, it can't split through the CO double bond. It acts like a wall. So the aldehyde proton, always a singlet. Okay, never a doublet or triplet for that proton, even if you have protons on the neighboring carbon. So even though we'd have like two protons here, it's not gonna be able to split with those. All right, so that's all you need to know about multiplicity. Just look for the number of neighbors and add one, and that's going to be your multiplicity. So if you have zero neighbors, you'll be a singlet. If you have two neighbors, you'll be a triplet. If you have six neighbors, you'll be a septet. Okay, not too bad. All right, so now that you know everything there is to know about HNMR, you should be able to solve the structure. If I give you the spectrum, will you be able to figure out the structure for me? There'll be a problem for you to practice in uh, your worksheet. Okay. Check out the next video for information about another form of spectroscopy, carbon NMR spectroscopy.